Class Academy. And really, I thought the, uh, the, the purpose of this is that what we wanted to do is basically get the individuals that are kind of on their path, right? This is beyond just um, the basics, right? Like, oh, why do you want to get into assisted living? Why do you want to get into uh, real estate, blah, 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 right? We want to take this to another level, which is, okay, some of you guys already have your homes. Some of you guys are doing deals that just, you know, that were like, wow, that's amazing. So we want to learn from you guys also to hold the new students accountable. So, you know, every month we have new people that are signing up that want, that want to do this, but they, they just get to a certain point where they sort of plateau and then they're like, well, what do I do next? How, how do I take the content I've learned and put it into the context of what I want to do next, right? Take the next steps forward. And so this is really the purpose of, of the master class. So a lot of it, I don't, I don't really necessarily want to be the one talking or, 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 you know, providing the information. I really also want it to be collaborative in the sense that you guys can also teach us, right? Hold us accountable, um, network with each other so that you can get, uh, develop partnerships with other individuals if you want to grow and you choose to do that. So that's one of the things that I wanted to discuss. We have a lot of updates. Our our own group is MD Senior Living. We have about 10 homes right now in Scottsdale. Just wanted to give a brief update as to what we're doing and what we're do what we're planning to do in the future. I would always like to showcase students that are progressing, just have a QA and just getting people started if this is really their first time uh, doing this. Okay, can you guys still see this screen? So I kind of went through the goals already, right? We're going to be sharing knowledge, networking, problem solving, really holding each other accountable and just growing beyond your first RAL and what you would do differently, even for the second or third or moving forward. We're on number 10, but I can tell you there's a lot of lessons that we've learned along the way. Uh, one of our senior partners, Mel, is on the line, so she she can definitely tell you, and I'm hoping at the end of this, we'll have her also put her two cents in. So just as a backup, I know many of you guys probably already know this, but what is residential assisted living? It's basically a non-medical facility. We're just taking care of ADLs of, of individuals that need that assistance. You know, oftentimes they're coming from homes where, you know, this, the kids are not able to take care of, of their parents anymore. Uh, they have their own lives. They're probably in their 50s They're probably in their 60s. They have children that are maybe teenagers or in their 20s, you know, so it's it's a cumbersome thing to have to take care of. and it provides a lot of guilt to these families who have to put their parents into assisted living. So what you want to do is provide the best possible value for these residents to provide a beautiful, safe, caring home and leverage your medical expertise so that they don't really feel that bad because they realize that the care that you're going to be able to provide is going to be 10x what they could do at home, right? So your average resident is typically in their 80s and 90s, and it's just too expensive to have a caregiver at home. Some, some estimates for just eight hours a day for 30 days would be over $20,000, right? Compare that for the national average of residential assisted living, and you're talking about four times less, right? Five to $6,000. So you can get a lot of value by having a residential assisted living. So really, the need for this is pretty much everywhere. One of the biggest questions I get is, hey, there's a lot of ALFs in my area. And uh, Evan, I wanted to ask you this, like, do you have a lot of, uh, where you're at? Can you tell them where, where you're at and how many ALFs you got going on there? Yeah, I'm up in Squim, Washington, S-E-Q-U-I-M. It's only a town of like 10,000 people. So we don't have a lot of RELs. There's a handful of larger facilities. Um, but really I think we're the third in the county, third RAL in the county. Yeah. So, so and a lot, how of, room to, a lot of room to grow. We have six, but our that's the max for Washington. Um, so yeah, you're like you're all a long waiting list. Occupied. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people would look at that and say, okay, ten thousand people that live there. 
oh my gosh, it's never going to work there because there's just not enough people. Or the converse is, hey, we have so many ALFs. Well, Scottsdale is overrun with ALFs and RALs. But, you know, we managed to do just okay. I mean, our occupancy is over 90% usually, you know. So that that doesn't really that doesn't really deter us. And I and I don't think it should deter you guys as well. But, you know, the main thing is like, why would you want to get into this? Right. So, I mean, yes, it is a very high cash flowing business. You can generate these revenues. I'm not going to harp on that, but it, uh, but. More so than that, a lot of people get scared away from RALs because they think it's just too much work, right? It's it's a lot of work because they don't know what they're doing, right? But if you understand what the benefits are, you'll understand that, hey, this is really not that much more work than if you had your own short-term rental or two, or if you had to deal with like stinky tenants and stinky toilets and stuff like that. If you really get into that, like I find that, the RAL side of things is less uh, uh, work intensive than it is to, you know, have a short term rental or a long term rental dealing with other tenants. But the real estate component has numerous advantages. The business component has numerous tax advantages. Right. So you can often actually offset some of your, you know, if you're W2 in your own medical practice, you can offset a lot of that by having this business thing that you can write off a lot of things. You can, it's e much easier to get a rep status, R-E-P-S status, and actually write off what they call, it's not active gains, it's called non-passive gains versus your non-passive losses. So there's a lot of advantages that come with having an, a, a residential assisted living. Now, granted, you know, when I was starting, I, I didn't never really thought about that. It was just another niche for me. I did like the fact that, hey, I could use my medical background. And this was like very unique, like uh, concept for me when I was coming into it. So that's really one of the things that attracted me to residential assisted living. But it's because it made me feel good. It's like, hey, you know, as a doctor, I can continue to kind of practice medicine in a way uh, within my investment niche, which is something you really uh, rarely can do in, in other investments, right? Any questions there so far? And guys, feel free to feel free to jump in and and um, and talk about this. You know, my own journey, like when I started with real estate, I just started with single family homes. I realized that you know this is not a great way to build high cash flow. It's a very slow way to build net worth and equity. So then I looked, started looking into actual um, uh, active, like real estate techniques, techniques such as flipping houses or even you know new construction. So this is a flip that we we did. You know, and I'm look, I'm not the one doing designing this, doing anything right. It's very passive for me, but they turned out really good. But I learned a lot in the process of doing all of these bills or flips. I understood. So I began to accumulate a lot more real estate knowledge along the way. So there's still new builds that I'm doing right now. We've got three projects going on simultaneously, one in Denver, one in Phoenix, and one in uh, Austin. And none of those are assisted living, but I'm hoping to leverage that ground up construction experience, possibly for the next residential assisted living deal, right? So I wouldn't make it a small deal. I would make it a slightly larger, keep it an RAL, but maybe ground up development. That way you can build a perfect product in the perfect location, right? So one of these, these are one of the goals that we've been throwing around in our own group. But as for me, like, so I, I got into real estate maybe 2014, just, uh, just dove in, started doing all of these other projects, just random stuff. But then by 2016, 2017, I realized like none of these real projects had a very stable concept, right? New construction, flips, they're all very market dependent. You're dependent on a lot of other people. Um, obviously, short-term rentals is a headache in itself. A lot of states are clamping down. A lot of cities are clamping down on that. So I wanted something that would be stable, steady, and could be recession resistant for years to come. And that's kind of how I got into residential assisted living. And so I had very limited knowledge, but I had a lot of self-limiting beliefs, I would say. 
I was thinking, oh my God, Scottsdale is just chock full of assisted living. There's full of residential care homes. Like how would I ever succeed with one home? You know, do I want to go big? But I kind of bit the bullet and basically started with my first RIL out there. And what I want you guys to understand is that real estate itself has its own benefits, right? We This is why we invest in real estate. And the best way to describe it is with this acronym IDEAL, where you can look at income, the depreciation, equity, uh, the exchange that you can do, the 1031 exchange, depreciation that comes with, with real estate, and, and the leverage where, you know, obviously you can get a mortgage. No other asset can you get, you can get a, own 100% of the asset by putting 20% down, right? So real estate has that built-in advantages. And you add to that, excuse me, you add to that the residential assisted living business side, then you truly got a winner because now you have numerous business deductions, the amortizations that you can do where you can write off a lot of the income against, uh, 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 against the losses that you're having on the business side. So you can, your business can pay the real estate side for a lease for that. So you can get double advantages in many different ways that you really would miss out on if you only had one or the other. Does that make sense? So with our own group, we basically, I started with my first acquisition in 2017. I spent a lot of time, probably unnecessary time doing renovations. But I kind of wasn't sure what I was doing at that time. You know, so, well, should I make it? Should I leave it as a five bed? Should I make it into a 10 bed? Essentially, I mean, eventually I decided, hey, you know what? I'm going to take this five bed. I'm going to make it a complete 10 bed, uh, 10 bathroom facility. I added on space in a garage and I was officially licensed and open in 2019. I partnered with my operations guy on the ground, who's, uh, who's Jeff. He had his own home that he was just taking off just less than two miles from me. And we came up with the concept of having physician ownership and doing something different than what all the other RAL homes in the community were doing. And that's how MD Senior Living was born. And we decided to partner. One of our first partners was Dr. Mel Renat. So she, she came on as one of our senior partners. And we just basically grew from there. And, you know, this slide, I'm not going to get into it, but basically, you know, if you, if you, if the more passive you are in a project, the less money you're going to make, right? So the, the more and more you do, the higher you get up in this pyramid. And I just put RALs on the top there, but a lot of things can go up there. But basically, if you're doing what everyone else is doing, you're going to, your ROI is going to be much lower, right? Your cap rates are going to be lower, but RALs are a totally unique breed because you have higher cap rates, you have better values and higher returns. So the more active you get, but the beauty is it doesn't really mean that you're doing more work. And that's the difference that I want people to understand. A lot of people get scared when they hear assisted living because they think, hey, this is just going to be a lot more work for me. But it, it doesn't have to be, right? Evan, what's what's your... What's your daily input into your own RAL up there? Depends on the day, that's for sure. But um, but are you, you know, there? Yesterday... I presume you're there every day, all day on the ground. No, I mean, realistically, I'm there probably once or twice a month. But that's because I've hired others to do my job for me. Right. And that's that's how we are, right? So we live in Orange County. Our team is on the ground. Yes, we're on the phone with them because that's, you know, we like to do that, right? We communicate heavily with our team members. And in retrospect, I would love to have done it where I lived locally, but and I can talk about why why we chose Arizona to begin with in the first place, but you know, I wouldn't change a thing about where I chose it because we have a good, strong team on the ground and that makes all the difference in the world. So anyway, Valencia Home, not to labor on this, but you know, we basically redesigned it, repurposed it, took it from basically a five bed, I think it was a four bath. Now it has 10 bedrooms, 11 bathrooms. Uh, it's, it, and I can go over numbers, but you know, almost every single room was renovated in this property, uh, you know, made senior safe, 
grab bars in the bathroom. Each each bedroom has its own unique flavor. Each bathroom has its own uniqueness to it. So I'm really proud of this property. But beyond that, we then grew and developed by adding more homes. So in 2020, so this is right before when pandemic was starting, we decided to buy two smaller homes, spent about six to eight months renovating it and opened and licensed them in the fall of 2020. Then we brought on a fund structure where we added additional homes uh, with outside investors, all of them physicians. We brought three additional homes. Um, we had several homes that were kind of like one-offs where they weren't really part of the fund. They were more experimental. We were like, okay, well, what if we don't own the real estate? What if we are just uh, running the operations and we lease a property? So we tried those things out. We had another group of outside investors reach out to us wanting to us to manage their homes because they bought the properties but didn't have management. So multiple models along the way, and these were some of the homes that we had along the way. Now, not all of these homes are still in our portfolio, and these are things that I want to talk about down the road where we're talking about, okay, well, why did this home work and why did this home not work, right? What made this area special and unique while this one, you know, we had trouble filling or having vacancy in there? So, you know, why is a five, why would we not do a five bed model at this time again? So a lot of different lessons that we learned along the way. And this is sort of, uh, and this just summarizes what I just said about the different models of what we did in terms of ownership. So what worked and didn't, first of all, I'm really proud of the caregiving team that we have. I think they're phenomenal. You know, these people go above and beyond every single day for their residents, right? Many of them have been there for years. They get to know these residents over time. And sometimes they get to know them more intimately than, than their own families do because they're spending so much time with these residents. Uh, you know, because of that, we've won a lot of awards, but we also try to keep in mind that, hey, this physician concept of ownership should mean something. It's not just, hey, doctors are owning it. So we're always trying to find innovative ways to try health tech or health services or anything that we can do to give our residents a, a step up in their care and health. I mean, ultimately, you know, they're there for to, you know, yes, they're in their 80s and 90s. They're most likely going to pass in the homes, but we still want them to have a good quality of life, especially in their final you know, weeks, months or years or whatever it may be. Right. They're not just going there to play bingo. It's like, hey, what can we do to keep them engaged ment mentally, physically, uh, socially, so emotionally? So there's a lot of different things that go into these pillars of care. So obviously, labor has always been an issue, trying to find good caregivers. But I think we do a very good job of trying to keep and retain our caregivers by hearing their concerns, right? We always tell them, hey, listen, we want to hear what is on the ground. We don't care. Like the point is not to throw blame. I don't want you guys to do that. There's an issue and it's not being heard. Come to us and talk it over and we'll try to find a solution. So that culture is always there where it's like, you know, we're going to listen to people and we want to get their feedback. And that's what I want in our homes, right? That culture is very important when you're starting out. And I think we do a very good job of that. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't get crazy and start doing weird stuff and then we have to let them go, right? We're not gonna, we're not gonna excuse negligence. We're not gonna excuse any of that stuff, right? It's does it happen very, very, very rarely, right? Where they get something happens and maybe they have some personal issues and they stop giving that care and attention that they used to. And that's tough, but you know what? It's it's for your own resident safety that you have to get rid of people and try to find people that that you can uh, provide good care and retention beyond that. You know, so what would we do differently? I feel like one of the things that we did was grow very fast. That's uh, we we started with one home in 2019 or basically two at that same time. And then by 20. By last year, we had almost 13 homes, right? So we're bringing on managers and directors and we became really top heavy in terms of our operational costs because we wanted to make sure at the end of this is that no matter how many homes we had, we still had that 
personalization and the care for each and every single one of these residents. We never wanted to lose sight of that. So, you know, we tried different methods just to see what would work as well, right? Like I mentioned, there were times when we didn't buy the real estate, but we just came on as operators and leased the things. You know, what are the advantages? So in a way, it allowed us, as we grew, we were trying out these experimental models and methods to see, you know, does one work better than the other? But in, in essence, though, it causes us to grow a lot and maybe a lot too, too faster than we would have liked. So that's one of the things that we would have done. And definitely I would teach people it's like, hey, listen, you don't need five homes. You don't need 10 homes. You know, one or two or three max is probably all you're going to need. You know, unless you're part of a big partnership, the cash flow that you're going to get from just a few of these homes is going to be so much easier to manage. It's going to be so much easier easier to deal with individuals because our biggest headache mel you want to talk about where our biggest headaches come from so we have depends are you talking about caregivers well, put it in there. <laughs> you don't have to get into specifics <laughs> but okay we have so the strangest just... stories from our managers and our caregivers that come out and it's just like amazing stuff and and i feel so we, like he said, you know, we grew really fast. So with that comes family or baggage, good and bad luggage, right? Um, so when we did that, we encountered a lot of different personalities. It was just, I feel that it was a lot more people, right? When you expand very fast, it's like we had this model that we like and we're experimenting, but then you're every home, you're adding on more and more people. So I feel that some of the pitfalls of just growing fast is you have a lot of drama and, you know, we're the type of owners that we want to be involved. So we told everyone <laughs> on the ground, let us know if you have any concerns, we're always available. But that was just taken out of context, right? So we have all these homes and then there's always drama with the caregivers and things that I've just, it's like, I, I'm sorry that you didn't like the way she moved your plate the other coworker. It's like, I think that's the part that we feel, and it may not even be that important when you have a fewer homes, but at least when he says drama, we, it's just all kinds of stories and drama between caretakers and team that we feel like we became involved in because we were so hands-on. So that's some of the things, you know. That yeah, so you have you to realize, build. right? We, with all these homes, we're, we have to, we have to have a, a caregiver pool of almost 75, 80 individuals, right? Because we need to have a certain amount to staff during the day. Uh, if people call sick, we need to have backup. So we need a certain amount across the homes every single day, plus the night shift, plus like backup, right? So if you, what we did was like, just hand out our cell phone numbers left and right. <laughs> like, hey, you got a problem and it's not being hurt. Well, you know what? They will call you. <laughs> so don't let that happen. I've taken more calls from caregivers assistant aides more than even my hospital calls it was just like at one point it was like I'm like why are you calling me I'm like but it's my fault because I gave out my cell phone and I said call me with anything you know and they you will get really excited you. yeah we have some weird stuff like we had one manager basically give her car uh to another manager right and this manager's her boyfriend got out of prison, stole the car, drove it to floor uh, to 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 California, refused to pay the the monthly lease on the car. It became an issue. Cops were I mean, like stuff like that. You're like, oh my god, like this is ridiculous. You know, stuff like that, and that's a true story, by the way. So she's got multiple baby daddies. Half of them are probably in prison, I guess. So uh, and I'm like, oh, my God, please just keep them away from our homes. We don't we don't need all this. But and anyway, you know, so Betty... that's what I'm saying. So keep it manageable and you keep it manageable by keeping it small. Right. You if you, you're not going to worry about that, you have one or two. It's going to be very easy to manage as opposed to having, you know, 12 or 13. And so, that's not to say that 
we all want to scale, right? So it's obviously we want to grow. That's not to say don't do that because obviously the goal would be to expand, right? You want multiple homes, you want to grow. But I think in the amount of time that we did it, I, I wish that we had spread it apart, you know? So we kind of had some time to digest, you know? I, I think it was very fast. So that's always my advice is like, take it slow. Cause yes, we all want to expand, but the amount of time that you're doing it under. Right. Right. So get get your foundation down. Don't rush for that. Uh, you know, make sure you have one. I mean, it's very attractive to to want to have more than one off the bat and go and jump and do that. And I think I came and I and I was kind of doing that because I was used to doing that where, where in my real estate realm. Right. You do one project, uh, a flip. It's very easy to do a second one because it's like, oh yeah, it's really no more extra work. I know this principles, but this is a business. This is not a passive investment. So you want to make sure you lay the front foundation down because once you do that, then you can great, grow and scale and you can do it with the team that you have because now they understand the system and the process and what you're looking to accomplish because you're guiding them in a way where it's you're telling them, hey, this is what I want. If it's not doing that, let's slow down and figure out what will work, right? So that's very important, I believe. Um, Evan, you got any tips you wanna share? Having done it yourself? Yeah, it it's, you know, we've only had, um, we only have two uh, caregivers on at a time. And for our home, we've hired three total. So two of them live on site and that adds its own drama, um, but it works really well for us. And I, I can definitely echo that, you know, keep it slow part because it's taken a long time to find sort of that second caregiver. One person we've had from from the very first day, it seems, and, and the other one has been a revolving door. Um, so that part has definitely been our big biggest headache so far and something I didn't expect. I thought it would be difficult to get residents um, or patients, but, um, it's actually been staffing. That's been our biggest issue. So yeah. I would, yeah, I would echo that growing too fast is, is tricky. Yeah. So that's, that's important to realize, right? Like it's always, it's always the human component, right? Whether you have a medical practice or whatever it may be, that's, it's always the area of focus. Uh, you know, we're used to like kind of barking out orders at a hospital setting or whatever, and it getting done. But this is very different. I don't bark orders at a hospital. Just... Yes, you do. <laughs> I've heard you. Yes, you do. <laughs> but anyway, going on. So wh what's our future plans look like? I mean, um, eventually uh, to go bigger. Like if I'd done this the first time around, I would have thought, hey, you know, I'm really glad I turned that Valencia home as my first project into a 10 bed. And it's done phenomenal. But now I would be like, well, could we have turned it into a 16 bed? And we're looking at a, a couple of our properties that are big enough to be able to do this, right? There's a whole process that we can talk about in a different webinar, but uh, of going through what it takes to take a property that basically the state has licensed us for 10. And by the way, someone asked the question is like, what's the maximum? And it depends on your state. So in California, it's like six bed, I think in Washington, Typically for the first two years, it's six bed, but then you can get a variance to increase it to eight bed. Uh, in Texas, it's 16 beds. So if, you can, if, you, if you're in Texas and you can do 16 off the bat, that's the way to go. So trying to maximize that, provided you have the right kind of real estate. You know, I'm not saying get a shoebox and try to cram 16 people in there. That's, that's not what I'm saying at all. So Evan, you're in Washington, right? Hmm? You're in, is Evan, you're in Washington? Yep. What, yep. what is the, Washington. so you're, you know, they were asking when Washington, what's the bed, the minimum? What's the, what's the limit for beds? You can have six right. residents. Um, um, but I think you have, if you want to go up to eight, you've got to file a separate application and you've got to have some other um, upgrades to your home, like an in ceiling sprinkler system. Okay. And you have to not have any citations of the last. I think it's just 12 months or so. So it's doable, right. but um, yeah. there's not a lot of people doing it that I know of at least. Yeah, but if you were to do it, right, it has a huge effect on your NOI. And your, your expenses don't go up all that much, 
but your revenues certainly do. And that's one of the things that we're doing. It's like, hey, instead of having all of these homes scattered about, what if we just took six from here and six from there and just made it into a fewer homes that's easier to manage and less expensive as well? Um, the, the five beds, one of them we've already sold. You know, they really broke even over time. Uh, we've had trouble making it. Uh, now, one, the other one's doing okay, but it's not, it's not making any kind of meaningful return. So this is going to be one of these homes that we will end up selling. Um, like I said, we'll do the 16. But we want, but now we know, hey, what are the areas of Scottsdale or Phoenix that are top performing and what these locations are? And this is really, you know, specific for our group. But how do we, do we want to continue? So if we were going to buy something, if a good deal came along, we know automatically, hey, what's it going to, what it reasonably can can make and what the expenses are going to be specific for that specific part of the city. So we now have all of that data because of all of our P&Ls over the last couple of years. And finally, even ground up construction, right? I wouldn't do ground up for a 10 bed. Would I do it for 16 or for a, what, what they call an ALF center, which is uh, more than 16 beds. So you can get up to like 20 beds in that. Uh, would those numbers make sense? These are things that we've been kicking out over, over the years as well, trying to look. I mean, of course, cost of construction is high. Interest rates are high. Does it make sense to do that now? But then again, you have an asset that if you do it right, can be very high cash flowing. You can refinance and pull back a lot of the money that you've invested. Um, I'm not going to get into this. I mean, there's a lot of demand. I mean, senior living is basically a spectrum. I mean, we're talking in the middle here where we're talking about memory care and assisted living, but there's a whole continuity of care, supervision, senior housing, and that trend is just only going to grow. I mean, uh, there's what, 10,000 people that turn 65 every day, only 4,000 are turning 80, but as those 65 year olds continue to age, more and more of them are going to need these more advanced senior housing solutions. Uh, only a small percentage are going to continue to be able to stay at home and age at home, but many will end up needing assisted living or memory care. The longer you live, the more likely people are going to have, uh, you know, uh, dementia issues. I mean, that's just that's just biology. So we want to be able to support that. You know, there's a lot of other things you can do within the senior housing spectrum, right? You can set up an independent living house right next door to your assisted living house. So now you have people that can age out of independent living and move into assisted living. So people are building small communities, CCRCs, you would call them, uh, to do that. And that's that's another thing that we're considering as well. You know, a lot of our properties come with almost an acre of land. So it's a shame to waste it when you can actually build casitas or independent living casitas uh, uh, for, for those properties. Um, I want to turn over this presentation to Raj so that he can kind of talk about his deal. Did you say you wanted to control it, Raj? Sorry, you're on mute, buddy. Where did my zoom go? There you go. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll 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 I'll, uh, I'll take control. Okay. All right, go ahead. You should be able to. And hi to everyone else that joined us here, by the way, guys. All right, guys. Well, can you guys all hear me? Good. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, I'm Raj Kalran. I'm based in the Bay Area. Um, pretty much born and raised out here. And I actually met Sandhill. Um, he was actually one of my senior residents back in Tampa way back when. But I kind of uh, wanted to share my journey out here. And so I'll do that now. And then um, at some point, if you guys are interested, I could show you guys kind of the project itself and kind of where we are in that. So um, I actually came across the whole concept of senior living, um, assisted living and memory care after listening to Sandhill on his podcast on Rich Dog Poor Dog, which was back in 2021. Um, the same night I listened to it, I actually woke up my wife in the middle of the night and said, hey, I want to get into this. Uh, mom, mom got sick a year prior 
and got squamous cell carcinoma with the oral cavity. And we unfortunately got a little scared and started looking at, you know, how can we get her home care and help if things turned bad? Um, just to give context, my dad's 86, my mom's 83. So, you know, they're at a very vulnerable age. And I, I can probably say that they're doing very well at this stage, but at that time we were very vulnerable. So um, anyways, I, I, um, I talked to my wife about it. I listened to the podcast again three weeks later, and I realized that, hey, I actually know Sand Hill, and he was my senior resident. So I quickly found out his email address. I sent him a message. And soon after, we had a quick phone call. Um, following that, I started doing some online research, looked at um, you know, what is senior living, what is assisted living, what is memory care. I started attending some conferences. Um, I learned quickly that doing demographic research, you know, identifying areas where there's high pockets of people that are seniors that need, that are 80 plus, are really advantageous to this industry. Um, and also identifying which cities have different policies. You know, we talked about six beds in Washington, 16 beds in Texas, you know, there's 10 beds in Arizona. And, you know, you quickly realize that you have to kind of confine to these restrictions as well as look for demographics that really suit this business. Um, so once I did identify where I wanted to build a senior care home, it was actually in Sonoma County, Napa Valley, California, which is very senior friendly and also uh, a higher middle class slash affluent community that could afford the services that we want to provide. So I started looking at care homes out there to acquire and properties to renovate um, into a care home. And while I was doing this, I realized that, hey, I probably need to build my team. Um, and in order to build my team, one of the key people on the team is the administrator. And so how am I going to hold an administrator accountable for their role it is by actually knowing what an administrator has to do. So um, COVID was helpful with that because we were all sheltering in place and my clinic schedule was light. So I was able to do my administrator training virtually to become an administrator. And then the exam honestly wasn't so challenging. So I went ahead and did that too. Um, I felt it gave me credibility in the, in the industry as well as helped me you know, hold the administrator that I'd have in the future accountable. Um, soon after, I actually found a property I liked. Um, it was a 16-bed assisted living and memory care home in um, Sonoma County. It had about 80 to 90% occupancy. There was some mismanagement going on in there as well as some turmoil in the family relationships of the owners. Um, so I thought it was a good opportunity. I got pretty deep into escrow with it. Um, I was in escrow... I believe it started in August and for about six months, you know, we were, we were moving, but not really like I wanted to. There were constantly delays in financial reports coming to me, a lot of family issues occurring behind the scenes. And so I continued to keep my eyes open and look at other opportunities as they are, um, came up. Unfortunately, in early 2023, about eight months after being in escrow without much progress, we fell out of escrow due to some family dynamics that had shifted and uh, kind of pending divorce. Um, what was good about this whole situation was that, you know, during this process of learning the demographics, doing some, you know, secret shopping, um, pretending I'm looking for a family member or whatever I was doing, I met a ton of people. And I also not only met them by doing secret shopping, but also by pursuing different care homes that I wanted to acquire, our properties I wanted to renovate, our real estate agents. And so the day after I fell out of escrow, an administrator I had met before actually reached out to me and said, hey, I got to introduce you to this really great building out here that I think could be the perfect memory care home. And so that's my current project. Um, I'm now acquiring a, a 10,000 square foot building that's actually in an active adult community. So it has 5,000 residents, 3,500 homes, and it's got everyone's 55 plus. It has um, a it has about 10 commercial properties in the community, and one of the commercial properties is actually an independent living and an assisted living uh, care home. So it has about 117 independent living beds and 57 assisted living, but it doesn't do memory care. Keep in mind, we share a property line with this independent living and assisted living community. Um, so with that being said, we, we had to look at city policy and what city policy and zoning code said is that you can have two care homes, no matter if they're assisted living, independent living, um, or memory care within 300 feet of one another. And 
we knew that these 5,000 residents, as they aged and they needed memory care, they were actually forced at this stage to go four miles away. And coincidentally, those four miles away was that care home I had under escrow. So I had already done the demographic research for this. And this community was a feeder to that care home. And now I'm looking at this building, which is actually in that community itself. So what I'm working on now is actually converting this medical dental building into an RCFE. And it's 10,000 square feet. The goal is to make it into a 22 uh, private room, private shower, private um, bath, memory care home um, with the potential to go up to 27. So five of the rooms could be companion rooms, but we realize the demographic care isn't really looking at you know, cost conservation. It's looking at really, do I want to live with a loved one? Do I want to live with my husband who may have memory care issues? Do I want to live with my neighbor or my golf partner or whatever? But And if they choose to do that and there's a financial savings as well as the business is viable by doing that, we'll do it. But our performa is really built on the 22 um, senior model. And believe it or not, it actually financially looks better as a 22 bed care home than it does as a 27 companion uh, care home. And that's because of the staffing as well as insurance issues that come along with it. So we'll provide up to 27 beds if the opportunity knocks, but we really can survive on a 22 bed care home status. Um, hey Raj, can you talk that, real quick about what your yeah what does what the expected uh, rates would be for for that member yeah. in your area? Hundred percent. So you know I've done a lot of research over the year. This started in February last year, so we're about a year and two months out. And um, originally, when I was looking at these, you know, the competitors in the market. I was realizing that the competition was around 10 grand. And this was about last year for the nicer care homes. That's 10,000 a month. That's usually all in. Some of these have those um, point systems and such where you can't really identify what their exact cost is until you, you know, uh, are a resident there. But you could say about 10,000 was the average cost. Since then, actually, two new really amazing care homes are more CCRC status. So one is called Watermark Napa and one is called Enso Village in Healdsburg. And these numbers are pretty high. They're charging anywhere between $13,000 to $18,000 a month per resident. And $18,000 a month is, you know, these are based on the point system. So that's really full dependence on everything. And then $13,000 is really like your um, mild cognitive dysfunction type deal. So that gave me a lot of motivation to move this forward. And keep in mind, none of these are MD owned and operated. None of them have the credibility that Send Hill brought up about having somebody in the healthcare system support the project. Um, so that's really given me the confidence to move forward. And even with those numbers of 13 to 18,000, you know, kind of being in our competitor space, I'm still building my performa on around 11 grand and 22. I'm still being conservative. If I can get it to 13, that's all. That's all extra for me, um, and 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 the investors that I have. But um, at this stage, we're really just doing eleven and twenty-two beds. So I, I'm not I'm not trying to be um, outrageous with the cost um, that we're going to be asking for the clients to pay. Um, along with that, you know, going back to the city approvals, one of the things we realized with that whole concept of independent living and assisted living next door is that you got to go through the city approval process and you know it can seem intimidating but I, I honestly believe the more speed bumps and the more walls that you face the less likely people are going to pursue a project so that gives you a almost an advantage if you decide to pursue it because when people hear like oh you got to go through the city and get a text amendment and change their zoning code and that's going to take four months of time and thirty thousand dollars of your hard-earned cash, a lot of people will give up right then, but realize if you're willing to go through that, you're more likely to be one of the few people at the end of it to get what you want um, done. So since then, we have gotten our text amendment, we've gotten our use permit. Um, I got an architect to design the building we want. We've gotten some pre-construction budgeting. I've established some financing. Um, I've actually built a team. I. I have an administrator that I've met at a care home that I intend to hire. And he's been huge. He's been 20 years of operating, um, of operations experience of a 17 bed care home. So I feel like he's very capable to take care of a 22 bed care home. 
And he's likely to be my administrator. And I talk to him almost daily on some of the basic stuff, you know, um, like for instance, today I, I got I had a call with our electrical engineer that's working on the project and he asked me what we're going to need for IT. And I was like, well, I honestly have no clue. Um, but, you know, the guy that's done operations for 17 years probably does have a clue. And so I'm going to meet with him, come up with the, you know, a vision of what that should look like and get back to them and maybe have a joint meeting at some point. So I think the team development process kind of goes hand in hand with the development of the structure and the care home itself. You can't do one without the other. Um, at least for me, without feeling extremely vulnerable and insecure, um, because honestly, the construction part, I don't really know. And the operations part, I don't really know. But what I can do is develop a team that does know that that'll support me in my uh, uh, aspirations. So along with that, we also did some networking and marketing, um, we looked at insurance. We are in a high fire zone. As you know, Napa, Sonoma County is you know, big fires in the last couple of years. So we looking at insurance still kind of dealing with that end of things. Um, and that was back in 2023. So now we're pretty much 2024. Um, we got approved back in March uh, for our text amendment use permit. We've locked in our architects, designers, engineers. Um, as Santel said, a lot of this isn't, you know, we don't sit there and design everything. I might have some input in regards to what I like or dislike but it's well beyond my scope to sit there and design a 22 bed care home uh, for seniors. I just, it's not my wheelhouse, but I'll learn it. Um, we've developed a website, we've got financing um, and appraisal are in process. Um, I went to a marketing conference last week or you know, last week, maybe last month. Um, and we recently got published in senior housing news. I'll share some of that with you guys in a couple of minutes. Um, we have a confirmed floor plan. We've done some local marketing in the community and neighboring businesses. So nothing like Google ads or anything like that yet, really just the article, a website and talking to every single person every time I'm at the building. And literally while I was on this call, I had someone send me an email saying, hey, can we get on your waiting list? And honestly, I'm not even, I'm probably a year out from having an open door, if maybe longer. So it's very encouraging. And I think, you know, um, bootstrapping it going down and knocking down doors knocking on you know businesses around talking to people is probably the best way to get your name out there even better than a google ad because hearsay and word of mouth is you know exponentially more valuable than any you know google ad or commercial that you can create on television um we continue to team develop network market work on insurance our goal is for 2025 for the construction to be in process, get licensing done, staff up our care home, continue networking and marketing, and ideally by summer 2025 have a grand opening and at least have you know 25% um, occupancy dedicated, um, if not more. Hopefully, so that's our journey. Um, and yeah, if you'd like to visit our website, we're mdseniorwellness.com. Um, we were on Senior Housing News last month. It was pretty cool. I can share with you guys the website if you don't mind for a quick second. Um, yeah, yeah, please do. Second. We'll pull that up real and quick. And by the way, so, awesome job on your success so far, Raj. I've been yeah. watching it from the ground up and it's like, you know, we'll jump on calls every couple of weeks. And it's like, I'm like, damn, I should have thought of this. <laughs> It's like phenomenal, yeah. Raj. Yeah, like, awesome. It, I, I, I give a lot of credit for where I am. First today. deal, you know? And listen, <laughs> guys, he's in a very high cost of living area, right? So this is not. I might take a, a room on that wait list, by the way, one day. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want to be up there in wine country, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that's that, that was part of the concept, honestly, is like I thought, you know, it's, it's, it's also a vacation destination. And so a lot of family would like to come see their loved ones, be it a grandparent or a mother, father or an aunt, uncle. If they can come see their grandparent and then go wine tasting or. So you know, hiking win. in the area. It's it's a win-win, right? So part of the concept was that. And honestly, my, my wife and I got married about five miles away from the same community. And we love the area so much. And that's one of the other reasons is we thought that as we grow and expand in this industry, that we can actually have a maybe a weekend home there where we can be close to our business and, and enjoy our weekends with our family there. That's amazing. Yeah, right. Feel free to share the, the your, your website real quick. So take a... Yeah. Yeah. 
So, so this is the article um, that was in Senior Housing News. As you can see, it was published back on March 20th, 2024. We, um, it didn't goes... change the screen, by the way. Oh, it didn't. Um, you may have uh, to oh. change. Let me see. Where Your share. Okay. Let's change my share. Um, new share. If I have to zoom at the bottom. Okay, here you go. Let's share this. Um, sorry. There you go. Does that share it? Yeah, there you go. Okay. So this was published on March 20th, 2024. This is another example, I would say, of just really talking to everybody and, you know, knocking on doors. I was actually at a conference on sales and marketing on senior housing in Tampa um, in early March, actually March like 1st or something of that sort. And um, I decided if I was going to get into this and I'll make this happen, I got to learn how to sell it and I got to learn how to market it and how better to understand that by these big box guys and some of these bigger boutique facilities because they have tried everything in the world and they have a lot more money to do that than I do. So I'd rather learn from their failures than do it myself. And so I was actually talking to one of the moderators in the elevator and just gave him some compliments. He asked me what I was doing. He gave me his card. He said, send me an email. Literally two days later, I sent him an email. The next day he called me, said, hey, talk to my um, editor. Editor called me up. He asked me if he could you know, record our conversation. And then at the end of it, I was like, hey, what are you going to do with all this information? You asked me like, you know, an hour and a half worth of stuff. Where's this going? Is it just like, you know, is it just part of your data research? And he says, no, we're going to publish you in, in next week's um, senior housing news. I didn't have a website, honestly. And this is Friday night. I got the website made over the weekend by somebody in marketing I had talked to like six months earlier said, hey, can you pull this through in two days? And she's like, yeah, she made the website by Tuesday. And Wednesday, the article was published. And that's been my journey the last two months. And um, it's it's been pretty amazing um, to, to, to be to go through all this, learn what I have, which I give Sendo a lot of credit for and um, be at the spot. You know, I, I think the landscape of healthcare is changing, which is really encouraging me to change. And looking at something like this, um, knowing where baby boomers are coming and what my own family may need in the future, and honestly, what even may I need in the future, um, really gives me the motivation to keep pushing through. So um, this is where we're at, and this is the progress we made. Love it. If you want to see the, some of the stuff that we've talked about, like, you know, part of this is going to planning commission and presenting in front of the commissioners and the mayor and having them approve things. Check out my website, mbseniorwellness.com. It has our presentation at the commissioner's meeting. It has our publication. It has kind of our background. Um, just to give a little bit more insight, my wife's a dentist. So, and I'm a PM&R doc. I'm a PM&R pain medicine, lifestyle medicine, and recently obesity medicine. So we plan to bring a lot of those kind of care modalities, including oral care into the care homes, which honestly doesn't exist today, which gives you another, un, you know, an advantage in the space. So um, if you guys have any questions for me, um, just feel free to reach out. Uh, my contact info is on the website. And yeah, thanks for hearing me out today. Um, and if you have any questions right now, I can take them too. Do I have any questions for Raj? Raj, that's it's a phenomenal job. Thank you for sharing your story. It's actually really inspiring for us too to see stuff like that and say, okay, well, you know what? Maybe we should be going bigger. Um, you know, I do want to wrap this up here uh, and just have some time for questions. I know a couple of people have asked some questions, but just to kind of show you what rates look like, these are these are up to date as of yesterday. Actually, this is from the Valencia home. And you can see that, you know, our occupancy is almost there. Sometimes we have one or two people that pass. Sorry, I hit the, I think I hit the power button <laughs> with my foot. I just killed my computer. <laughs> and, uh, well, anyway, so I had a few more slides. I'm not going to belabor the point, but I, so I know some people had some questions. Do you guys just want to get on camera or just ask your questions directly and we can, we can bring it up from there. I think Saba had a question. Uh, yeah, I had asked it. Um, uh, I, I, I can make it more generic. Like, have you ever targeted trying to do um, the assisted living towards different um, cultures, like 
like directed towards like the Indian community or Asian community or something like that, or um, like to uh, kind of um, invite those. Cause I know like sometimes there's some stigmas against assisted living in, in certain cultures. So does anyone want to feel that? I'm definitely considering doing something like that up here in Washington where I'm at, there's a huge uh, native American population and they, um, you know, they get some assistance from the government, but I think that there's an opportunity to provide some, some housing for them in particular in a group home setting that might be advantageous to them that, that currently isn't necessarily available to them or, or, or maybe they just don't, they don't know about it, but um, that's in this area. My wife is Mien, which is, uh, she's from Laos and her, she's got a huge community in the Seattle area which is, you know, a couple hours drive away. And so I've talked to family members about doing that specifically for, um, for her family um, mm -hmm. in, in Seattle. So I think there's, at least in Washington, I think there's opportunities to do that. I'm not sure about so, other states. Yeah, perfect. And, and absolutely, I think it's, I get asked that question a lot, especially for the Desi community. And and I and I realized that you know there are assisted living facilities that that do that right now. They'll have like a wing dedicated to like say a certain Asian population where they'll cater in food specific for them. So there's a lot of South Asian like uh, assisted living facility wings, but I've never seen a house fully like that. But I do know that it would actually be a very good concept, especially if you're in a community where there's, you know, for example, if there's a lot of Indians there, they would want that. And you can tailor the food. You can get a chef that makes food like that. You can bring the musicians that cater to that kind of culture, right? Like the the food, the, the events, the fest, uh, festivals, whatever it may be. Uh, I'll give you a, a little anecdote with the first home that, in fact, that Valencia home. We made it unique when we first started it by making it women's only. So only women could go there. And at first I didn't realize, you know, would that be popular? Is that something families want? But it became unbelievably popular because that's what really families wanted. They wanted, they didn't really want co-ed, right? Their mom's not looking to date in their 80s and 90s. They're just looking to like have a safe place that they want to feel amongst, you know, kind of their own right to to so for a long time we did this for years until finally we changed it to a co-ed model but valencia home was our woman's only place and it became very popular and very attractive so i don't see why it wouldn't work for you know other specific populations and such so yes i i think it's a great model to have all right anyone else Let's see, someone wrote, do you have recommendations for furnishings such as that are appropriate for RLs? So yeah, I mean, you have to think about what's senior safe. I mean, we go through all of this uh, in, in detail in terms of what is senior safe for residents. A lot of it is just going to be, okay, well, are they a fall risk? You know, do they need grab bars? Do they need ramps? You know, you want to avoid houses that have two stories, right? So anything... Uh, you want to avoid large steps. You don't want you, you don't want like a bathtub in your in your in your bathroom. You want things that are easy to step over or step into. Uh, trip hazards throughout the. You don't want rugs. Carpeting is also not something that we would recommend anyway. Like remember, there may be spills. There may be body fluids. You know all that stuff. You don't would definitely want to deal with a headache of carpet. So tile, hardwood floor is all fine things uh, you want to avoid are trip hazards. Um, Raj, your facility, you're renovating it. What, what else are you doing there to, to change it around? Uh, but, I mean, honestly, it's a medical dental building. So right, it's almost like a ground up construction. We just have the roof and the walls at this stage. So, um, but yeah, we are, we are, I actually hired a designer to do this because again, out of my wheelhouse with such a big project. So we are using somebody named uh, Lisa Sini, who actually has a really cool show on Amazon Prime called uh, Infinite Living. And she really embraces evidence-based design, which is mm -hmm. using, you know, kind of like evidence-based medicine, but just for senior care. And coincidentally, she has a hundred bed care home that her husband operates. So they really have utilized their own personal ex experience. Um, 
take a look at what she's doing. And she has a lot of uh, kind of nice pearls in her Amazon Prime special called Infinite Living. And um, she's our personal yeah. designer now. So we're excited about that. Oh, wow. Very cool. Where is she based out of? Ohio. Oh, nice. Very cool. Yeah. So there's a lot of designers in this space as well. And in the past, we looked at hiring one of those individuals too, but it really wasn't economical to do it for a small 10 bed, right? But if you're doing something larger, certainly something to look and consider into. Very good. Anyone else? Well, I don't have anything else to add. Mel, any final thoughts? No, I just think this is awesome. And it's amazing to see so many people follow. He was my mentor, then became my partner. So it's great. Like we get to, you know, I learned so much about senior living through Sentel. So it's been great. So it's really nice, Raj, that you listen to his podcast. And now he has an academy, which is great. So I'm really excited that all of you guys are doing this because it's been very fruitful for us, you know? Okay. And I hope you guys, the ones that are just starting out on your own journey, I hope you make it across the finish line, have your own RAL. And you're going to realize your second and third, it's just the same thing that, that once you learn the concepts, you can grow and continue to expand and scale. So, well, I don't have anything else to add. So we'll try to do this on a monthly basis. We're going to have another individual, uh, a broker in the field. And I kind of want them to give an update as to, hey, what's the market look like for assisted living? I know with interest rates, it's kind of really been... Uh, challenging, right? To have high interest rates. How do you take down these homes? How do you do financing? So I want to get into that as our next topic. If you guys have topic ideas and recommendations, I have a whole bunch that I wanted to share on my slide, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get to certain topics over time as well. But the next one will really be in, in mid-May and uh, so look out for that, okay? Wonderful. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ando. Appreciate it. Have a good day.